Just you and I, baby girl. Hey. Yeah. Oh, why? Just you and I for a life. Just you and I for a life. Just you and I for a lifetime. Just you and I for a lifetime. Yeah. Just you and I for a lifetime. Woo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's tie a knot for a lifeline. Yeah. Oh, why? Yeah. You call me the door. Like me, I mean. Thank you for joining us. Like I'm getting a few minutes. Just you and I for a life. Just you and I for a life. Just you and I for a lifetime. Just you and I for a lifetime. Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you. Please note that this session is being interpreted in different languages. To listen to the session in your language, you will need to select the correct interpretation channel. If you're using a computer, you can see the interpretation option, the globe right there in the menu. Uh, so you can choose your language at the bottom of your screen. Please select the language that you want to listen to. If you're using a cell phone, you can find this option in the three dots at the top of your screen. Once you have done this, you should be able to listen to the interpreters. Para escuchar la, la sesión en su idioma, necesitarán seleccionar el canal de interpretación correcto. Si usan una computadora, pueden ver la opción de interpretación de su idioma en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Es el símbolo de un globo terráqueo. Seleccione el idioma que desea escuchar. Si usan un celular, encontrarán esta opción en los tres puntos de la, de la parte superior de la pantalla. Una vez lo hayan hecho, deberían poder escuchar a los intérpretes. Hello, everyone. Hello, beautiful young wonders across the globe. Friends, folks, family, tribe, how are you doing? Please leave your favorite emoji right now in the chat. It's good to be here with you, connecting with the mycelium of regeneration to give the lens to one of the most important topics of climate justice. We are talking of what happens when we fail to adapt and the less responsible lose their livelihoods. Today, we are talking about loss and damage. My name is Jen. I'm a youth climate activist, champion of the GYC, finance co-coordinator of the ELCO in Chile and contact point for the Finance and Market Working Group of Yungo. I'm one of the moderators today and I'm happy to be here with one of my favorite beings in the whole world. Hello, Myrna, how are you? Hi, Dan, and hi, everybody. Thank you for the introduction and welcome to the second session. My name is Myrna, and I'm super excited to co-moderate the session with the wonderful Jen. A little bit about me. I work as a United Nations volunteer at the UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund, Egypt country office. My work is focused on climate change and youth engagement. Like Jen mentioned, today's topic is going to be loss and damage. You should be able to see the agenda on your screen shortly. We have an amazing lineup of speakers for you guys today, and we have a wonderful performance lined up and a really fun activity there. Um, I will note that a lot of you asked in the previous session for a community space, and we will make that happen. We'll give you a community space, but we need a little bit more time to work on that and work through it right now. In the meantime, please remember to follow our rules of engagement, which are to treat all participants with dignity, respect, and courtesy. 
regardless of their background, if this is your experience, to use polite language and respectful language, avoiding any offensive or derogatory terms, to ensure that all voices are heard and valued, respect your time and ours, put the effort into attending the sessions or watching the recording. And for the Mentimeter, please submit questions that are relevant and address our speakers with respect. Now, before we get to the nitty gritty of the session, please go to the Mentimeter and tell us where you're tuning in from. Yeah, you can go to menti.com and use the code right here in the screen. If uh, the technical support team can also put it in the YouTube live and the chat, that'll be wonderful. So I'm gonna stop sharing screen now. So Marina, you can. There's some music on here. Yeah. Just you and I for a life. Just you and I for a lifetime. Yeah, just you and I for a life. Just you and I for a life. Just you and I for a lifetime. All right, so a great majority of from just Europe right now. Let's be, see if we can beat that. Asia is growing quickly. Yeah. All right, so the code is thir three one six eight zero two nine five. That is great, a lot of people from everywhere in the world. All right. Yeah, go ahead, Myrna. You can introduce it. All, All right. So now, thank you all for tuning into the Mentimeter. Now we're going to have our youth speaker for the day, uh, who is Ibrahim Mohammed. Ibrahim is a multi-talented individual who wears many hats. He's a climate activist, a digital storyteller, a grassroots organizer, and a certified teacher. He is recognized for his award-winning work as a digital activist. He focuses on supporting initiatives that promote good governance, climate change, education, and mitigation. He is currently an Early career scholar for an inclusive stock take facilitated by the IGST at Center for Global Sustainability in the University of Maryland. Ibrahim, please go ahead. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And um, I think um, she introduced me clearly and um, she did justice to that. And um, well, I'm going to share a bit of my experience, especially with regards to loss and damage. And um, first of all, I am from a town popularly known as Zaria in Kaduna State, Nigeria. And um, well, my drive uh, with respect uh, to environment and environmental activism dates back to about 19 years ago. I think then I was 10 years old when um, majority of households in my community were flooded claiming lives and properties mm -hmm. and forcing a lot of um, families to relocate. Some are displaced and um, at that moment, it, it, it appears to me actually as something strange because um, I think I was born in a community where the environment is actually a safe space, especially um, in a case that the environment is green and um, having a, a, a high amount of green cover. It's um, a Nigerian quarters here in Zaria. 
And um, my dad retired around when I was 10, and that is when we vacated to that community. And um, it actually appeared to me as a strange event. And um, it took me long years to keep thinking, trying to address this issue, trying to understand, oh, what's the cause of this particular problem? Some information I was able to get are pushing the whole scenario directly to religious beliefs. And um, some people we are thinking maybe the community is caused. Everyone has his own perspective with regards um, to this particular issue. Then until in 2015, while I was um, conducting my research during my final year in undergraduate studies, that um, I'm conducting a research on um, the effect of food insecurity on academic performance of um, chemistry students, especially in secondary schools. That is when I came across um, um, the whole concept of the sustainable development goals. And um, I got actually attracted by climate action, protecting life on land, access to energy, clean water, um, and sanitation. And um, that is where I have the background of my journey in um, climate activism, and I kept searching for information, trying to learn a lot and um, compare some of the scenarios with the available literature. And um, I get to realize there are a lot of things happening that are associated to that. And um, having that experience and um, coupled with the recent experiences I had, like in 2020, a fellow climate activist who is from the same community with me, his house, his, his family house is flooded. He lost a lot of properties, even though no life has been lost. Mm -hmm. And then um, my family farm is affected by the prolonged rainfall, where a majority of the agricultural output started germinating before even harvesting. And I think we lost about 13 tons of maize. And um, you can imagine the losses, especially for a family that practices only subsistence um, agriculture, where what we cultivate is solely for us to feed ourselves throughout the year. And then um, I was able to attend COP26 um, in Glasgow. I was opportune to be there in order to ensure that I represent the voices of people in communities like mine, where it's a, commun it's a riverine community, which is actually vulnerable to the impacts of um, the climate crisis. And um, unfortunately, I couldn't um, navigate my way at COP26 until when I was able to find myself at COP27 in Egypt. And um, prior to that, I Nigeria experienced um, a devastating flood, which has not been experienced for the past 10 decades. And I think it's a lot about 30, 30 states out of the 36 states are affected by that flood. Um, I visited a, a community called Dabi community in Jigawa state, where majority of the people in that community depend solely on agriculture. And um, annually they cultivate about 1,500 um, hectares of farmland, but it's so unfortunate that about 1,400 hectares of farmland is washed away by the flood, not to mention young people that are washed and lost, old people that died, houses that are demolished, and um, a lot. There are food stores and stuff like that. Because when I visit the community, I see a lot of people. They are technically internally displaced at the moment. Some of them are now living in schools, abandoned buildings, and some of them have to migrate to other communities where they lost totally what they, they, uh, they have because um, um, they are, probably their house is submerged. And, um, you know, of course, they can't stay um, on top of water because they are not um, um, organisms that live in water. They are not marine um, organisms. So you can imagine the in-depth of the impact, especially in such communities. And, um, and that actually inspired me to keep pushing and find a way to ensure that I represent such communities at COP27. And I joined thousands and thousands of young people I'm glad Jesse is here. He 
led a lot of activities we did at COP, which is amazing music, advocating for climate justice, demanding for reparations for loss and damage. And then I'm glad that um, at the end of it all, we are able to come back with an agreement to create a fund for loss and damage. I think um, and then when I get back home, even though actually I'm discouraged because I feel we deserve not just an agreement, but a funding mechanism to pay reparations, to make available a, a strategy where the funds are to be generated, as well as how people that are impacted by this crisis are going to be reparated for the losses and damages are incurred as a result. And um, feeling inspired and somehow um, unmotivated, I sat down and write a poem on the loss and damage. And I titled the poem, Loss and Damage Fund. And I think it's something that I would like to share with you now. Um, yeah, I feel, I think I will um, recite the poem. And um, just as I said, uh, the, the, the title is Loss and Damage uh, Fund. And um, here it goes, in the wake of the storm. All is lost and damage done. Houses and hearts both lay broken, memories scattered and hopes gone. Amidst the winds a raging sea, loss and damage we all see. Families torn, homes destroyed, their future uncertain in despair. The winds of change blew too strong, swept away what was was strong, leaving nothing but despair in this world of constant repair. But amidst the rubble a rain, a glimmer of hope still remains. For every loss and every pain brings a chance to start again. But hope is not yet lost, it is true. For a solution we can turn to. A fund that brings relief in sight to restore what, what was once bright. So let us gather what we can and rebuild our lives with care. For every loss, a seed is sown and a brighter future can be grown. The loss and damage fund is called a beacon of hope a beacon of hope standing tall to bring relief to heal the land and help communities stand. Loss and damage fund a reality, standard mechanism of operation not in place, appointing fossil colossus for COP28 league. The fate of the planet lies at risk. With each donation, big or small, it rises higher to help us all. And soon enough, the sun will shine in a world that's no longer confined. So let us give what we can and help our fellow man. For in the face of loss and pain, together we will rise again. Arise, arise, arise in unity for a better planet. Make available reparations for loss and damage. The future of millions depends on that. I think, um, yeah, this is uh, the point I was able to come up with after COP27 when um, an agreement was reached on um, the loss and damage fund. And um, it is clear that this is a fight. I alone cannot do it. Jesse David cannot do it alone. It's a fight for every human, every human living on this earth, because we have to ensure climate justice for all. We have to live in equity, transparency, and accountability. That is why I particularly have been following the global stock tick, which is a mechanism to take stock of the Paris Agreement's implementation and ensure that in that process, there's transparency and accountability. And um, especially for young people from Africa, someone like me, I know Jesse might have experienced similar among other young people, we lack access to resources in order to represent the voices of people that are mostly affected by this climate crisis. As I'm talking to you currently, I've been battling to have access to visa to attend um, the SB58 in Bonn in order to follow up with uh, the global stock take round tables and um, conversations around global stock take and um, one major area of interest, which is um, on the global goal and adaptation. But unfortunately, the time isn't on my side and I was able to mobilize all it takes, but without access to visa, I might not be able to, there, to be there. So these are some of the challenges we face in Africa and uh, the global South in general, because there are young people, a lot of young people that understand the whole scenario, understand Africa's circumstances and scenarios when it comes to the climate crisis. 
But unfortunately, they don't have access to the platforms, to the resources, to influence the decision making, to um um yeah, to influence decision making and to ensure that um climate justice is there for all. I think I will stop here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share. No, thank you, Ibrahim. That was wonderful to hear that beautiful poem that you just made. And thank you so much for your work at COP representing communities. And I hope this would also empower more youngsters or young people to speak up for the damage that the communities are facing because of climate change. I thank you so much. And now um, I'm going to share my screen again. Oh, you, you're, you guys are already doing it. So Friends, I know you are worried about the forms. Uh, this one will be available for one week. Uh, you can find it right now uh, in the QR code in your screen. So grab your phone uh, if you have one uh, at hand and um, put your camera on the QR phone and, and, and fill it out. Now, whoop. now we will hear from Dr. Silent. Salimul is the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development and a professor at the Independent University of Bangladesh. In addition, he chaired the expert advisory group for the Climate Vulnerable Forum and senior advisor on locally led adaptation with the Global Center of Adaptation, GCA. He is a senior associate at the IIED and was also previous director of Climate Change Research Group he, he is an expert in adaptation to climate change in the most vulnerable developing countries and has been a lead author of the first, fourth, and fifth assessment reports of the IPCC. He also advises on the least developed countries groups in the UMNFCCC. Dr. Salim, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yen, and thank you all for inviting me to join you here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm going to um, share my experiences in the climate change process, which goes back a long time. I, I'm, I've been in this process for well over three decades now, starting from the Rio conference in 1992 onwards. And I'm one of the few people who's attended every single one of the 27 conferences of parties that have been held so far under the UN Framework Convention. But I hasten to add that I don't attend as a negotiator. I go as an observer. I'm a scientist, I'm an academic, I'm a researcher. But I do have a role in the negotiations as an advisor to the group of countries called the least developed countries. There are 46 of them, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also my country, Bangladesh, where I'm speaking from now. So I'm going to uh, share three sets of <clears throat> messages on the topic of loss and damage, wearing uh, three of the hats that I have worn over the, this period. The first hat is as a scientist. I've been a lead author of the IPCC for many years. I, I was a lead author in, uh, in the uh, third assessment report, the fourth assessment report, and the fifth assessment reports, not the last, the current sixth assessment. I, I stopped my involvement uh, after about 10 years. Um, and then secondly, I will talk about the policymaking arena in the UNFCC, and particularly the Sharm el-Sheikh decision, and what's going to happen after that on the funding for addressing loss and damage, and then thirdly, and most importantly, I'll talk about the reality of loss and damage and the role of all of us as individuals and citizens, and of all of you, particularly younger people, in terms of what you can do and what you need to do and what I feel you must do. So let me start with the science. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is the scientific body that was set up many years ago, about three decades ago, to gather scientists from all over the world and ask them to assess the state of knowledge, the state of science on climate change. And they do this through three working groups. Working group one looks at the climate models, telling us what's going to happen in the future if we continue as we are. Uh, the second group, which I used to belong to, working group two, 
looked at impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation. My special uh, area of research is adaptation. I work on adaptation. And I was a lead author and then coordinating lead author uh, of the uh, in the IPCC for three assessment reports. And then the third assess the third working group is on responses. What do we do? And what are we learning by doing things? Uh, and then at, at the end of the three reports, there is a synthesis report that brings together all the different, uh, the three working groups. And over the years, the number of scientists and the number of disciplines who have been working and the people from scientists from around the world has increased enormously. Several thousand scientists from social scientists to natural scientists to climate modelers are uh, all working. And in the latest sixth assessment report, there's actually a new dimension looking at justice, equity, and fairness, which didn't exist before the sixth assessment, which is a good sign of people realizing that that's an important dimension of tackling the problem. Uh, and if you're interested to read them, I recommend they're all uh, uh, freely available on the IPCC website. The main reports are extremely dense <laughs> and complicated. Unless you're a, a PhD student, I wouldn't recommend reading them. But the summaries are accessible. Oh, they all have summaries. Uh, please do go look at the summaries and those should be understandable. I'm going to cite two outcomes of the sixth assessment report that is relevant for the loss and damage discussion that we're having here today. The first outcome comes from working group one who produced their report uh, last year before the Sharm El Sheikh uh, COP. And for the first time, this is the scientists, this is the, the climate modelers. The modelers for the very first time were very clear and said that they now had unequivocal evidence that climate change due to human induced emissions of greenhouse gases is now happening. They can see it, they can see attributed, the word they use is attribution. We can attribute the impacts of climate change to the fact that global temperature has gone up well over one degree centigrade, and that is now attributable to the emissions of greenhouse gases. Incidentally, there's a report out, in fact, just today, saying that the 1.5 degree uh, ceiling or agreement that we had agreed in Paris not to breach is going to be breached within the next five years. By 2027, we will pass 1.5 degrees. Unfortunately, we have not been able to stop it. But nevertheless, we need to keep uh, our efforts going and, and keep uh, on trying to bring temperature uh, within bounds and not keep on increasing forever. And so the, uh, the Working Group 1 report was the first time that the scientists were very clear that they can demonstrate attribution. And the attribution scientists are becoming much, much better. They can now attribute uh, the impacts of climate change, not so much new impacts, but intensity of impacts. They can now say that a particular flood, for example, the flood that took place in Pakistan last year was 30% more intense because of human-induced climate change. The flood was not caused by climate change, but it was made worse by climate change. And that is exactly how the scientists do that. I, I can tell you here, sitting in Dhaka, Bangladesh, that in the last two days, we just um, were saved very narrowly from being hit by a super cyclone called Mocha. It was coming towards Bangladesh and it became a super cyclone while it was on the sea, in the sea. And it was heading to our country in the southeastern part of the country, but at the last hours, it veered to the east, hit us a little bit, but then went to, into Myanmar and it caused more damage in Myanmar. Fortunately for us in Bangladesh, it didn't cause that much damage, although we were prepared for it to do a lot of damage. And Bangladesh has a very good cyclone preparedness program and we evacuated many hundreds of thousands of people to be ready for it. And so the point I'm making is that these climate change events, impacts are going to happen. They're going to get worse. They're going to get more severe. And every day, every week, every month, every year, if you watch your television screens and you watch the weather uh, uh, reports, you will see an event taking place somewhere in the world that was completely unusual, bigger than anything we had before, either heat or cold or uh, 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 rainfall or lack of rainfall. 
all of these dimensions are going to get worse and worse and worse. And no country in the world is ready. And these impacts are going to cause losses and damages. Losses and damages are now a reality due to human-induced climate change. And we have now entered what I call the era of loss and damage from climate change. We, in during our lifetimes, during your lifetimes, this is going to continue. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better for a long time. If we keep on uh, our efforts to reduce emissions, then we can make it stop maybe at two degrees or just over two degrees. But the 1.5, we cannot stop anymore, unfortunately. It's going to go through and every little bit is going to make things worse. And so if we don't stop at 1.5, we're going to have to try and stop at 1.6. If we can't stop at 1.6, we're going to have to try and stop at 1.7. We just have to keep on trying to stop the emissions of greenhouse gases to keep the temperature threshold uh, not going out of control. If it goes out of control, then the, all bets are off. There's no prediction of what is going to happen. The only prediction is everything is going to get totally topsy-turvy completely different from what we've had before. So the next 10, 20 years is not going to be the same as the previous, any set of 10, 20 years in previous history. We are now going to face that and we are not ready for it. And it's going to cause very severe losses and damages. So that is the message from the science world, the scientific world, very, very strong. The second uh, point I'd make uh, with the science world is that the uh, the working group two, which is on impacts, uh, vulnerability and adaptation, which I used to belong to, they, their report came out a few months later, early this year, and they reinforced this message of impacts happening. They were now seeing impacts despite our efforts to adapt. You know, one of the differences between mitigation and adaptation, mitigation is reducing emissions so that the, uh, the emissions don't cause any harm. Adaptation is reducing the emissions, uh, reducing the harm, preparing for them, minimizing the loss and damage, but it can never be reduced to zero. We, even the best adaptation will, over, will be overcome at some point. They, we cannot adapt to everything. And so adaptation is a, a, a ameliorative. We can minimize, but we cannot bring to zero the impacts that are going to happen. So while we need to continue to do adaptation, we unfortunately now also have to do uh, um, uh, the minimization of uh, uh, addressing loss and damage. And in the, in the loss and damage climate jargon, we use three words to, uh, uh, to describe the different ways in which we um, tackle uh, loss and damage. The first word we use is avert or avoid. Uh, that maps onto what we also call mitigation. Mitigation is reducing the emissions that cause the problem, greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide and methane and others. Um, when you reduce, say, a ton of carbon dioxide to zero, then the impact of that ton has been brought to zero. That's by far the most important and most effective way to prevent loss and damage, to avoid loss and damage. So the first strategy is mitigation to avoid loss and damage. We've been doing some, but we haven't been doing enough. The second strategy we call minimizing loss and damage. Minimizing loss and damage maps onto what we also call adaptation to climate change. And as I said, adaptation, good adaptation uh, minimizes, but doesn't uh, reduce to zero. There will always be a residual impact, loss and damage, uh, but good, good adaptation can do very well. It can help a lot. And I'll, I'll give you a very good example just from the last two days. Bangladesh is very well adapted to cyclones. You know, we got the warning, hundreds of thousands of people took shelter. We were ready for the cyclone. Fortunately for us, it didn't hit us directly. It hit a, a little bit of our country and then it went to uh, the Rakhine state of Myanmar. Myanmar was not ready. They did not prepare. They got hit. The death rate, uh, uh, the current death rate, the last I saw, was well over 100 people lost their lives in Myanmar. It would not have happened in Bangladesh. We were ready for it, okay? So uh, good adaptation will minimize the impacts, not bring them to zero, but minimize them. And bad adaptation will just simply uh, cause more loss and damage. So uh, a good adaptation is effective in minimizing, but not bringing to zero. And then the third word, which is 
the most critical word that is the the word that got uh, issued and addressed and uh, debated in Sharm el Sheikh in COP27 and before that in COP27, COP26 in Glasgow is the word address. So avert, which is uh, min uh, mitigation, minimize, which is adaptation and address. Address happens when the climate impact has happened. We just got hit by the cyclone. We can't adapt to it anymore. We're just going to have to address the impacts. A lot of people lost their homes. Fortunately, in Bangladesh, there weren't many lives lost, but a lot of damage was done. And so we are going to have to deal with that damage. That is loss and damage that is now happening in Bangladesh and in Myanmar, just to give you two examples from the last 48 hours. So this is now the reality of the world we live in. If you watch your television screens by tomorrow or day after tomorrow, you'll find another thing happening somewhere else in the world. And, and this is now going to be a reality. The new reality is impacts causing losses and damage in reality all over the world. So let me move from the science to the, uh, the, uh, the, the UNFCC arena. And I know Linda will be talking about this in more detail, so I won't go into the details of the uh, the different things that have happened on loss and damage from the Warsaw International Mechanism to the Santiago Network. And, but I will touch on the, the last bit, which was the, uh, the establishment and agreement to establish a, a mechanism to address loss and damage, a funding mechanism to address loss and damage, which we achieved in Sharm el Sheikh after a lot and lot of uh, fighting and, and debating it was a very politically sensitive issue, but we managed in the end to get the result, a very positive result. The decision uh, um, says that a transitional committee will be set up with 22 members with membership from different constituencies around the world. That has happened. It's been set up. It had its first meeting. The decision said they should meet three times before COP28. They, they've decided to meet four times, which is a good sign. They're getting on to the job. They're going to be meeting. If you want to follow it, they're all for you can follow their actions online. I won't go into the details, but they're very active and they will report back uh, in COP28 in Dubai in December. And in COP28, we hope to have a decision to take things forward. I hope we will have a good result to actually address in reality with money and not just another decision to do it in COP29 and then COP30. If we go by the normal process of UNFCC, we, it, it takes three, four, five COPs from a decision to action. Uh, we can't afford that. We need a, a action in COP28, and I'm hopeful that we'll get some action. I am certainly pressing them. I'm following this very, very closely, and I keep pressing. I know the transitional committee members. I tell them, you are going to be held responsible for delivering something in COP28, not just talking about doing something, but actually doing something. And so I am hopeful that this will happen, but it's going to be very tough, very difficult. It's not going to be easy at all, but I, I remain hopeful that we will get something uh, in COP28. So before I end, let me touch on the third uh, area which I'd like to uh, emphasize and, and uh, in my opinion is by far the most important, which is what can all of us as individuals do? And in my view, each and every one of us now have to think about our role. And I tell uh, people, particularly young people, I'm a professor in a university, I have a lot of very, very bright university students so, uh, that I teach and who work with me. And I tell them that as of now, as of this year, your, your citizenship of planet Earth supersedes your citizenship of your country your national citizenship, Bangladesh, Chile, uh, Egypt, whatever your citizenship is, does not matter. You are now a citizen of planet Earth. And this is a planetary emergency, a planetary scale problem that's going to require planetary actions. Now, the planetary action we have by our leaders is the UN Framework Convention, all the presidents and prime ministers come to the meetings and they say things, they promise to do things and they don't do them. So they are failing us. They're not, not delivering at all. Delivering little bits and pieces, delivering a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. Uh, and in, in uh, uh, delivering what they say they, they want to do, they say they'll do it, but then they don't do it. So we can't rely on them anymore. We have to push them but we can't rely on them. We are going to have to organize ourselves. And young people are doing that. And I, I see all of you 
on this call as being the vanguard of doing something. And I'll give you three pieces of advice from my side on what it is you can do. The first thing is you have to engage with the issue. Pick whatever you want, pick mitigation, pick adaptation, pick loss and damage, pick climate justice, pick climate injustice, whatever it is that you feel strongly about, pick that topic and learn about that topic. Unfortunately, it's quite complicated. Any topic you pick up is complicated. It's not very simple. We can, we can simplify it, but you can't just use simplified language for it. You have to have some level of understanding and, and uh, learning that you will have to invest your own time and effort to learn about one particular aspect of the problem. And the second thing I would say is don't just study the problem, study the solution to the problem. There are many, many solutions all happening all over the world. Find the solutions that you think are uh, applicable to you, where you live, where, where, you, where you're located, and get involved in actions with, lo with local people, with friends, with neighbors, with uh, fellow colleagues. Find like-minded people that you can join forces with to take some action at the local level. You can do something. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, you can actually do something, but you have to figure out what it is you can do. I can't tell you what to do, but I'm telling you, if you put your mind to it, you will find something that you can do. And then the final uh, piece of advice is link up with people around the world, as we are doing right now on this call. People around the world you will find are working together. The, I'll just give you one example that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Every Friday, the Fridays for Future school kids come out of school and they demonstrate around the world. In, in my country here in Bangladesh, thousands of school kids come out every Friday. Uh, this is inspired by uh, Greta Thunberg, the Swedish teenager who started uh, this movement all by herself. She would sit every Friday, she would sit with a placard in front of the uh, Swedish parliament in Stockholm and say, I'm not going to school. I'm going to boycott school until somebody does something about this problem. And then people started joining her and she's been doing this now for several years. And, uh, and the movement has gone uh, global and it's a very effective movement, I can tell you. They all link up with each other, they take actions and you need to do the same. Journalists, uh, uh, activists, uh, scientists, whoever you are, whatever you do, you need to be involved in taking action to tackle climate change. And the, the final point I'll make is, to the extent that you have the ability to influence decision makers and politicians in your own country, or if you are able to go to the COP, uh, to go to the COP, uh, by all means do that. But going to the COP really is not a big deal. I mean, if you think you, you can go to the COP and influence the decision there, it's not gonna happen, all right? A lot of people go to the COP it's worth going if you have an opportunity. You'll certainly find it very interesting as a networking opportunity. But if you think you're going to influence decision makers, you're not. They don't going to listen to you. They, they won't even give you the time of day. Uh, so don't have high hopes of going to the COP and getting them to listen to you. But do, if you have an opportunity, go to the COP just to be able to network with people from all over the world. It's a wonderful opportunity to do that. I'm going to stop there. I, I think I've talked longer than I should have. Uh, thank you very much. No, honestly, hold on. Yes, thank you so much. Your, your insight was super insightful. And I mean, the situation is definitely dire and the science is clear, right? So the climate change is already impacting like the impacts are already here and we need a focus on good adaptation practices to adapt to that and we need action now like we hope to see more financial support from countries this year individually and collectively action is key and this is where young people need to mobilize so right now i'm going to share my screen and everyone will get a chance to ask dr uh huh oh god i'm sorry i can't pronounce your name properly so i'm just going to avoid saying that right now and please go to the mentimeter using the code 31680295 to ask dr salim Mool the question you call have. me salim salim the questions yeah, that you might easier. have thank you so much i'll give you all a minute and then i'll switch to the screen of the mentimeter
in the meanwhile, everybody, please remember that we will be creating a community for this training. So you don't have to worry about doing that. The attendance form is open for one week. So just sit back and enjoy the lecture. And if you're watching in English and would rather watch in French, Spanish, and Portuguese, please send us an email so we can sort it before next week. I'm going to move to the Mentimeter now and see your questions. Jen, can you lead the Q&A? Yes, sure. Uh, so we got our first question here, uh, which is voted nine times. How can we effectively quantify loss and damage? Um, thinking on the IPCC, of course, this is also something that is addressed. Can you give us your insights? Sure. So um, quantifying loss and damage, particularly from extreme events like cyclones, hurricanes, uh, wildfires, etc., it's not difficult. We've been doing it forever before climate change happened. Uh, every time there's an event, uh, we calculate uh, how much uh, uh, was lost and damaged. Let me just give you a little uh, nuance on the terminology. Uh, why do we say loss and damage? Right. So there are two reasons why we say loss and damage. One is uh, in the UNFCC, we're not allowed to use the words liability and compensation. Those are taboo words. Those are politically sensitive words. And the developed countries, particularly the United States, simply does not allow us to use that. That is, you know, we, it, it is that uh, strong a taboo. The words liability and compensation are not allowed to be used. And so loss and damage is a euphemism for liability and compensation. The other uh, point to make about loss and damage is what's the difference? What is loss and what is damage? And so there is no, again, identified and agreed uh, uh, definition. Um, one of the reasons why that is, is that, you know, uh, one of the ways in which we get agreement in negotiations is by having some level of uh, undefinitions. So the, because we don't have a definition, people can define it in a way that they like. And they can say, this is something that means what I think it means. And the other people can say it thinks it means what they think they mean. So not having definitions is actually a way of getting results. And this is a loss and damage is another example of that. So anyway, so the point about loss and damage, the difference is loss, we generally now tend to refer to things once they're lost completely, cannot be brought back. So human life lost, no amount of money is going to bring that back. Biodiversity loss, no amount of money is going to bring that back. On the other hand, damage a house is damaged, you can rebuild the house. A road is damaged, you can rebuild the road. So damages can be repaired, losses cannot be brought back. These are the two terminologies that we use for loss and damage. Yes, and in, indeed the value of nature is uh, infinite, essentially. So uh, the next question is, how can the language barrier between the scientific world and the general population could be closed? This is a very important. Very important and not easy. And that's the role of journalists like yourselves. OK, so we I'm a scientist. I'll use scientific jargon. You, you are the journalist. You have to explain it to the, uh, the, the your editors first and then to the public in the language that you use. So um, I'll, I'll use the example of loss and damage. You know, a lot of journalists come to me and say, what is loss and damage all about? And I say liability and compensation. And they say, why don't you say that? Liability and compensation, we can understand. My editor will understand. My editor doesn't understand loss and damage. And I tell him, well, you know, in, in the UNFCC, we're not allowed to use loss, uh, liability compensation, but you can use it. You tell your editor it's all about liability and compensation, and then they understand it. <laughs> that is so funny. Okay, last questions. What needs to be done at COP28 to make the loss and damage fund effective, efficient, equitable? What is your opinion? My opinion is that we cannot make the perfect the enemy of the good, or I call it good enough. We have to do something now. The urgency is now, not later. And so right now, a lot of discussions about different options. I don't want them to take more time. I want them to come up with one thing that they can actually deliver in COP28 and deliver it. I, I had the opportunity to speak to the president of COP28 uh, he, he has invited me to be one of his advisors. He has a big group of advisors. They just announced it. And I told him that I'm a one agenda person. I want something to happen on loss and damage in COP28. 
not postpone it to COP29 and COP30. You have to deliver in COP28. And you as the president have to tell the transitional committee, you want them to deliver something. They can't, they don't have to deliver everything, but one thing they must deliver that make it happen. And that's what I want to see. And I said, I will judge you on that. If you don't deliver something, I'll say that you have failed to deliver. I don't care what else you do, but if you fail to deliver something on loss and damage, I will declare COP28 a failure. Yes, indeed. Uh, that is very rough, but very true. Uh, we need compensations now. We saw what happened last year in Pakistan, and that was not covered by the loss and damage fund. Exactly. So uh, we definitely need help, some help for the countries and communities that are facing the effects now. Thank you very much, Dr. Salim. Uh, your presence here is most welcome. Uh, now we are going to pass to our next activity, which Thanks for, uh, thanks to the insights that Dr. Salim brought us, we can make a, a, a better example of this activity. Can you turn the slide? Excellent. So uh, we are going to, oh, what a beautiful photo. Okay, next one, please. The activity for today is focused on common position building. Yeah, so we're going to support our fellow or uh, constituency, Yango, and their inputs for the submission processes. So what we're going to do is, again, go to the mentee, and together we are going to answer this question. What should be included in the language or the words, the concepts that this loss and damage fund should include? from a youth perspective. So you can say anything that you want to be included in the Mentimeter. So we can bring those inputs and together with the loss and damage working group, we can develop um, a submission or a declaration and let the decision makers know in advance, like, uh, doctor, uh, like the doctor said, COP is like the last, moment where things happen and usually decision maker doesn't even have time at cop to hear us and for us to make the enough impact so things are decided way back the pittsburgh dialogues bond and then cop like those processes are as important or even more important if we want to change the face of this reality so now can we can we go to the mentee to see what our friends are ans answering. And please remember to, if you want to share what you think should be included in a story of a post or a poem or a drawing, you can tag us and add the hashtags, the official ha hashtags for our session. <laughs> Beautiful. We got 60 answers already, great. Answers are popping up. I love Sam. I, I, I'm I pretty sure Sam from the Loss and Damage Working Group is going to be very happy with your inputs. Okay, so we see compensation, policy and fairness, appropriate policy to developing nations. Accountability mechanism that needs to be included. We are all the bodies. We need more social imaginary <laughs> justice. Grants instead of loans. Intergenerational justice. Fair share, repairing. Justice seems to be the running theme here. There's a lot of justice. <laughs> Decolonization. Okay, so how are we running in time, dear team?
Derechos. Rights. We need to have a clear knowledge regarding with how hard the loss and damage are, and then it should be easy to get funded. Consultations with indigenous and local communities, bottom-up approaches, access and equity, cost impacts, early warning. Yes. Thank you all so much. We have 241 answers and a lot more are coming in. We will look more into these later, but we have to move on now to our performance. So now we're going to listen to a performance by Jesse, da Jesse Davis. Jesse is a highly talented musician, climate activist, an advocate for sustainability. His music is not only captivating, but also serves as a powerful tool for driving change and raising awareness about climate change. Jesse's dedication to environmental causes is commendable. As an alumnus of the Nairobi Summer School on Climate Justice, he has gained valuable insights into the challenges posed by climate change. He strongly believes in the importance of youth engagement in addressing this global issue, and he actively advocates for it. Jesse, please go ahead. Hello, hello everyone. I hope you can hear me. We can hear you loud and clear. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, my name is Jesse, is a part of a climate activist and activist. And I use music as a tool of advocacy. I'm also an alumni at the school, and that is where I learned that I can use music and we can get to power change together. And at whatever position you are as a young person, you can use your gift, your talent, or anything that interests you to pass the message of advocacy and also to champion for climate. So this song is called Hope You Can See. It's a song that's just explaining and also getting to show what's happening in our world right now and how we can take action, you know, because music is a universal tool and also getting to share this music at COP27 really got the voices of the African youth to be amplified. So this is the song, it's called Hope You Can See. The horizon bloody, the sun is frowning, the moon is dim at night. I see the wind is angry, tears from the ocean, and the mountains are shaking in pain. I see, hope you can see. I see, why can't you see? I see, hope you can see the climate's changing. Yeah, I see, hope you can see. I see, why can't you see? I see, hope you can see the climate's changing. River running dry, no rain in the sky. My people always cry, they can't farm in the dry land. Cause there is food insecurity, battle with anxiety. What's the remedy? Gender inequality, wars of the century. What's the remedy? Energy crisis, poverty in our streets. What's the remedy? I see, hope you can see. I see, why can't you see? I see, hope you can see. The climate's changing. I see, hope you can see. I see, why can't you see? I see, hope you can see the climate changing. So what do we want? Climate justice and when do we want? Now, now, what do we want? Climate justice and when do we want? it Now, now, what do we want? Climate justice and when do we want? it what do we want? Climate is this way. I see. I see. Why can't you see? 
see, I see, hope you can see that the climate changing. I see, hope you can see, I see, why can't you see, I see, hope you can see that the climate's changing. Uh, that's called Hope You Can See. It's uh, one of the songs I've written. I've written a couple of them. So I'll share one more song. Good time, I think, after a few minutes. <laughs> and it will be it. It's called No Planet to Be. It means we don't have any other planet. guys that's uh the time i had the songs that i've written on advocacy and uh it's just calling for action for each and everyone to take a step to know that it's our responsibility as young people to communicate and have and take that step to make a change yeah thank you guys thank you so much jesse that was absolutely amazing uh seriously honestly thank you so so much uh, right now, we're going to go for a small five-minute break. Jan? Yes. Oh, my God. I almost cried. It was beautiful. All right, friends. So let's grab something to drink or just have a little walk inside our house or go to the backyard and feel nature because we need to rewind everything that we we're, we <laughs> we learned today and definitely come back in a few minutes so i'll put some background music um so we can have a wait see you guys later
Remember to hug your mom. Sending hugs to Ecuador and all the youth there. It's a really hard time right now for them. Our government just fell down. All right. Welcome back, everybody. And thank you so much, Jen, for the music. Uh, as everyone can see, we've told you that the attendance form is going to be open until the 24th of May. But here it is again, if you'd like to scan the QR code. In the meantime, we are going to introduce our next amazing speaker. We are now going to hear from Linda. Linda is an environmental lawyer based in the UK. She's been involved in the United Nations climate change negotiation process since 2005, with a special focus on the issues of adaptation and loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change. Linda is particularly familiar with the climate change concerns of small island developing states and least developed countries having directly supported country delegations through the provision of strategic, legal and policy advice. In addition, 
Linda teaches on environmental law subjects at the postgraduate level and has conducted a number of negotiation skills training sessions for a wide range of developing country groups in Africa, the Caribbean, the Pacific, and Southeast Asia. She's written extensively on a variety of environmental law topics and is currently working towards a PhD in the area of green building regulation. Linda, it's amazing to have you. Please go ahead. Um, thank you very much to, um, to Oxford for inviting me. And um, this is a very hard act to follow. Ibrahim, Salim, and Jesse, um, great uh, to be part of this panel. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I'm one of those people who has a, a PowerPoint presentation. So just bear with me for a few seconds while I do that. Um, let's put it into slide mode. Great. Um, kia orana. I have the great pleasure of joining you from the large uh, ocean state in the South Pacific, the Cook Islands, um, one of the countries that uh, I help support in the climate change process. Um, I'm going to uh, help fulfill one of, uh, hopefully help fulfill one of Salim's directives to you in that if you're interested in um, an issue around climate change, you need to engage in the issue and learn about it. So I'm going to, from a legal perspective, try and give you some insight into how loss and damage is, is, um, is captured in under the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the framing legal, uh, international legal treaty um, around climate change. Um, we're going to look at the underpinning of loss and damage in the UNFCCC process, how we got started, the institutional arrangements and, and governance um, arrangements, and then we're going to look at where we are now um, operationalizing the Santiago network, which we'll talk about that, and, and financing for loss and damage, which was everyone's um, hot topic for the year. Um, so where did we get started? Well, it started a long time ago, believe it or not, in 1991, when Vanuatu, another Pacific Island country, put forward a proposal um, during the negotiation, actual negotiation process of the UNFCCC itself. So that process went from 1990 to 1992. The UNFCCC, um, the framework convention was adopted at Rio and, and Salim mentioned he was at the Rio conference in 1992. Um, so Vanuatu for the Alliance of Small Island States, which was created uh, during uh, the negotiation process, submitted a proposal for consideration. And um, this proposal was meant to be part of an insurance mechanism that was in the draft text of the convention at that time. And this proposal was to establish an international climate fund. 30 years later, here we are and a separate international insurance pool to provide financial insurance uh, against um, the impacts of sea level rise. Uh, in formulating the insurance pool, the proposal um, asked parties, countries, to consider, among other things, the methods of funding the pool, the types of loss to be covered by this pool, how to evaluate loss from sea level rise, and limitations on the amount of compensation payable. So these are all um, issues that the transitional committee uh, are looking at in respect of the loss and damage funding arrangements and fund. Um, and that was this was a proposal from 30 years ago. So you can understand how, how long it does take sometimes for international law to, um, to evolve. Um, the, the final bit of the proposal um, was the funding bit. And um, the proposal was that developed countries should fund the pool based on a formula modeled on the 1963 Brussels Supplementary Convention on Third Party Liability in the Field of Nuclear Energy. So basing um, the funding equation on an existing piece of international law, and that 50% of the fund would be um, based on a country's uh, GDP, so its ability to pay, and 50% of the total contribution would be based on the level of CO2 emissions. In other words, the responsibility associated with causing the impacts. Well, what did we actually get in the convention? We, the only remnant of language on insurance can be a 
found in Article 4.8 of the, of the convention itself. And it says, in the implementation of the commitments in this article, parties shall give full consideration to what actions are necessary under the convention, including actions related to funding, insurance, and the transfer of technology to meet the specific needs and concerns of developing uh, country parties arising from the adverse effects of climate change and or the impact of the implementation of response measures, especially in countries. Um, and there's a list of countries A through I. Um, many, of the, many of the countries in that list are, are uh, countries that are vulnerable to um, uh, geographically vulnerable, but it, this list also includes countries whose economies are highly dependent on income generated from the production, processing and export of uh, fossil fuels. So <laughs> this, this is potentially a problematic paragraph because it links um, mitigation uh, actions and the detriment to certain economies as a result of mitigation actions and actions needed to um, address the adverse effects of climate change. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we break how this link was broken, but let's look first at some of the other language in the convention uh, itself, which speaks to responsibility um, of, of countries for creating impacts and also looks at um, responsibilities of states for causing damage in other um, in other states. In the preambular language of the convention, we have um, a language that says the largest share of historical and current emissions of greenhouse gases has originated in developed countries. The global nature of climate change calls for an international response. And we heard that from Salim, that, that, um, that to address climate change, we have to be citizens of the earth. This was recognized way back in 1992. Um, states have the sovereign right to exploit, the, exploit their own natural resources, but the responsibility, and here we have um, the, the, term, the, the word responsibility, to ensure that activities within their jurisdiction or control do not cause damage to the environment of other states. So this idea of, of linking responsibility and damage um, uh, was is is embedded in in the convention language itself, and the the preamble. Uh, Recall certain UN General Assembly resolutions um, around the possible adverse effects of sea level rise. So, um, learning about the legal aspect of 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 how we um, uh, frame climate change is 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 critical, and understanding that these ideas and notions are not new. Um, the objective of the convention itself um, requires countries to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions within a time frame to allow us to adapt. Um, we heard from Salim that in five, in less than five years, we likely will supersede the, the 1.5 degrees Celsius temp temperature limit. So we've already gone past this time frame. We've, we've, we're starting to hit the buffers. We're starting to reach the limits. Um, and certain principles of the convention also look at responsibilities and understanding that we all have a responsibility to protect the climate system, but some of us are more able than others, uh, more capable than others uh, to do that. And that this principle of differentiated responsibilities and respective uh, capabilities is, is really critical to the justice um, debate and the rights debate. Um, it recognizes that vulnerable countries um, have specific needs and special circumstances and that they need to be addressed. And finally, it looks at this notion of irreversible damage and not waiting until the damage happens, uh, but taking precautionary measures to, to in, in an attempt to prevent irreversible damage. So even in 1992, we were starting to consider the possibility of damage that, um, that we couldn't recover from. Um, so we talked about Article 4.8 and the link in that article between uh, addressing climate change the, and its adverse effects, but also the impacts on economies um, from actually mitigating or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And this historically had a significant chilling effect um, towards a positive progress on adaptation under the convention because 
um, it, it, it linked to um, sort of opposing actions. Um, this link was broken in 2007 at the COP in Bali, where um, countries worked out a two-year plan to a COP in Copenhagen uh, for some form of legally binding outcome on climate change. And in that plan, the separation between um, mitigation activities and adaptation activities was achieved. And so this link, this article, um, the Article 4.8 link was broken, and the Spali Action Plan included um, language around risk management and um, finding the means to address loss and damage. So this is when the term loss and damage first came into the convention process. Unfortunately, the Copenhagen COP uh, kind of fell apart, and this legally binding arrangement um, didn't happen. But in the run-up to that, uh, that conference in 2009, a number of countries came up with draft legally binding agreements that included loss and damage. And so loss and damage was well and truly on the table um, by 2009. The following year, when parties picked up the pieces from Copenhagen um, in a, a set of agreements called the Cancun Agreements, um, at, parties established a work program um, to uh, address loss and damage. It took two years um, to for us to get there. But after this two year work program, um, in 2012, at COP18, parties agreed that the convention did in fact have a role in promoting the implementation of approaches to address loss and damage and envision the establishment of institutional arrangements under the convention at COP19 in 2013. Um, before we move to the next slide and look at the Warsaw International Mechanism, which uh, Celine mentioned, um, the Cancun decisions also provide um, a, a sense of what types of slow onset impacts countries might um, incur. It's a non-exhaustive list, but we're starting not only to uh, think about addressing the impacts, but trying to understand what those impacts are in, in legal text. So um, in 2013, parties agreed to establish the Warsaw International Mechanism. It's called the Warsaw International Mechanism because it happened at COP. Uh, 19 in Warsaw. Um, the mechanism was established to fulfill the role of the convention in uh, promoting the implementation of approach, approaches to address loss and damage. So the role of the convention that was agreed in 2012 now has an institutional arrangement to, um, to implement that role. Um, and the three functions of the Warsaw International Mechanism are based directly on the role of the convention uh, in addressing loss and damage. And these are namely to enhance knowledge and understanding, strengthen dialogue, coordination, coherence, and synergies, and enhance action and support. This is uh, perhaps the critical one for us now, including finance, technology, transfer, and capacity building. Um, an executive committee was established to guide this implementation, and it's currently working. Um, one thing that um, was a sticking point um, in Warsaw, and I was there, was that the WIM was established under the Cancun Adaptation Framework. And parties at that point in time, certainly developing country parties, were concerned that um, loss and damage being when adaptation reaches, reaches its limits, um, and, and um, focus on loss and damage could potentially be watered down um, if, if uh, the whim uh, continued to be under the Cancun adaptation framework and language to make developing countries more comfortable around, around this uh, juxtaposition between adaptation and loss and damage is the recognition um, in the decision um, in Warsaw that um, loss and damage can occur when adaptation is not enough. So we move on just looking at um, the, the executive committee of the Warsaw in International Mechanism, the committee that has the responsibility to implement the role of the convention in addressing loss and damage. Um, it has 
20 members, 10 developing country members and 10 developed country members. It meets twice a year, um, sometimes more often depending on, on um, issues it's addressing. And it guides the implementation of the WIM um, via a work program with five strategic work streams, loss, slow onset events, non-economic losses, comprehensive risk management, in other words, assessing loss and damage, um, human mobility, uh, and this is um, around migration, displacement, and planned re relocation, um, and action and support, including finance, technology transfer, and capacity building. It has the authority to establish subgroups, and there are a number of expert groups that help the ex executive committee to do its work. Um, right around the time when the executive committee first started meeting in 2015, we were in the process already of uh, negotiating the Paris Agreement, and it was a, a developing country position. The, develop, the developing world was unified in in um, in advocating for a separate article on loss and damage in the Paris Agreement, and um, and and uh, in. Indeed, there, there is an article, a separate article on loss and damage in the Paris Agreement. Let's look at what that article um, says. In, in Article 8, which is the loss and damage uh, article of the Paris Agreement, um, parties, countries recognize the importance, and here's the, here's the, the, the spectrum that uh, Salim set out averting, minimizing, and addressing loss and damage. So averting, um, Salim characterized as, as mitigation, minimizing um, Salim characterized as adaptation and addressing is, is what happens when it when we have loss and damage. Um, so the, the Article 8 recognizes the full spectrum of um, a, approaches to, um, to loss and damage and, and what we do. Um, Article 8.2 says that the, the Warsaw International Mechanism is subject to the authority and guidance of, of the governing body of the Paris Agreement. Article 8.3 um, says that parties need to enhance their understanding, action, and support um, in respect to of loss and damage, and that this should be carried out in a cooperative and facilitative manner. And in Article 8.4, we have a list of areas for this cooperation and facilitation. This article, from my personal perspective, is not perfect. Outside of the use of the word support um, in, the, in this language, there are no provisions for financing approaches to address loss and damage. Um, and there's no differentiation here between developed and developing countries. So this notion of responsibility um, that we had uh, embedded in, in um, certain provisions of the of the convention itself um, isn't there. And um, and in the decision that adopted the Paris Agreement, we have this um, language, and uh, Salim alluded to it in paragraph 51 of this decision. Parties agreed that Article 8 of the agreement does not involve or provide a basis for any liability or compensation. So this was the this was the bargaining chip that was required to get um, loss and damage into the Paris Agreement. That uh, liability and compensation um, would be off the table in terms of discussions under the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. Um, it took three years for parties to work on the rule book. Um, how to implement the Paris Agreement. And in that three years, um, countries were successful in broadening the scope of Article 8 um, so, such that parties now may report on, on uh, loss and damage, their, the impacts they may be feeling or, or how they're addressing loss and damage um, in the, in the um, reporting system that was developed under the Paris Agreement. And also, um, parties may consider loss and damage in the five yearly global stock take. We're in the process of going through a global stock take right now um, and, uh, under the Paris Agreement in the five yearly uh, global stock take that, that gives us a barometer of, of how well we're doing in terms of implementing the Paris Agreement. So parties were successful in, 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 in expanding the Article 8 um, provisions to, to be included in other um, and other processes under the Paris Agreement. 
Um, so where, <laughs> what happened uh, right before um, before the Sharm El Sheikh COP? Well, in 2019, we had uh, the second review of the Warsaw International Mechanism, and one of the outcomes of that was the establishment of something called the Santiago Network, um, which is meant to catalyze technical assistance um, for in developing countries um, that are affected by um, the adverse effects of climate change and are dealing with loss and damage. Um, so an additional institutional arrangement um, to, um, to help uh, catalyze uh, local action on loss and damage. And then we had a two year break um, because we had a global pandemic and parties talked a lot, but very little um, decision making actually happened. When we got to Glasgow in 2021, parties were ready to, to hit the ground and decided on functions of the Santiago network and decided that there would be funding for this Santiago network and attempted to, um, to establish a financing facility for um, loss and damage, but, uh, but we're, we're not developing countries, we're not successful in that attempt. And, um, and what was established was a Glasgow dialogue to discuss uh, arrangements for funding activities to address loss and damage. So just a, 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 a space to talk about funding arrangements, but, but no establishment of funding arrangements themselves. But the, the year following in 2022, and we all know about this, um, uh, there was an attempt, a successful attempt to establish funding arrangements and a fund for loss and damage. Um, and that is part of one of the important uh, decisions, COP and CMA decisions that came out of the Sharm El Sheikh uh, conference last year. Um, there was also a timeline uh, for fully operationalizing the Santiago network. So an another funded source of providing um, uh, technical assistance and, and action on the ground um, for developing countries. And, um, and also we looked at, at work, um, ongoing work of the WIM XCOM. So what's happening this year? Um, well, we'll have a continuation of the Glasgow dialogue. So at, at the upcoming intercessional um, discussions, we'll, we will have the second uh, Glasgow dialogue, which gives us an opportunity to talk about issues in particular around the funding arrangements. This is an opportunity for parties to get together and do some more thinking, parties and um, non-party stakeholders. We also have um, the choice of host for the organization of, of the San, uh, Santiago Network. Um, we will have meetings of the transitional committee all throughout the year. And as Salim said, there will be four. There, were also, there are also going to be um, workshops set up by the secretariat. We've already had one workshop. And um, the first global stock take will be finalized. And I added the global stock take in there because the global stock take um, um, can and, and will be taking, um, uh, taking loss and damage into account. And, um, and there should be um, some recognition of um, loss and damage in this global stock take, uh, if in, in my, from my perspective, it's, it's successful. Um, my last slide is um, kind of stepping back away from the UNFCCC and where we find loss and damage and certainly financing for loss and damage under the convention process and looking at um, broader <clears throat> calls for reform of development and climate finance um, in the international system. And I think it's really important to consider um, uh, looking at operationalizing funding arrangements and a fund for loss and damage in this broader context around um, financial reform or, or proposals for reforming the, the international global um, development financing arrangements. First of all, um, in the COP27 CMA4 decision uh, around uh, funding arrangements for loss and damage, parties called uh, invited the UN Secretary General to convene in international financial, financial institutions to talk about funding for loss and damage and an invitation directly to these international finance institutions to consider contributions to, for funding loss and damage. So direct calls outside the convention to consider financing for loss and damage. 
there is some uh, an initiative um, afoot called the multi-dimensional vulnerability index, which um, which was a SIDS initiative, initiative, a small island developing states initiative, to um, to use vulnerability criteria and not economic criteria for um, for getting a loan uh, for getting grants uh, to address vulnerability. Um, uh, the, I'm almost finished, I know. The Prime Minister um, of Barbados has an initiative to look at reforming um, the international financial system. The French president will hold uh, a, a, a summit at the end of June to look at reform of the international um, financial system. And the UN Secretary General will include um, climate finance in the uh, September Global Climate Action Summit that he'll be holding at the UN General Assembly. So just for you to be aware that um, we're, we're concerned about uh, funding for loss and damage under the uh, Climate Change Convention, but there are uh, broader reforms uh, around international finance afoot. Um, Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you found this rather legalistic approach to loss and damage of interest. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and um, and happy to answer any questions. No, thank you. Uh, that was brilliant. And yes, indeed, uh, sometimes the UNFCCC sounds like a silo, uh, like something that only works in the, in the space of climate action. But uh, there, there actually things are coming out and they're getting like real transformation in terms of the financial infrastructure. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, that as well. Myrna, I'll pass the floor yeah. to you. Thank you so much. So everyone can go to the Menti and ask questions, submit questions for, Dr. for Linda. Uh, we already have some questions submitted. Uh, so I'm just going to immediately go to that. So the first question is, what role should countries like China, U the UAE, or Saudi Arabia play in loss and damage financing or beyond financing? That's a very complicated and heavy question right at the get-go. Um, thanks for that question. Um, it's it's a it's an interesting one, and uh, there I think we, what I'd like to do is look at the Paris Agreement and what the Paris Agreement um, says around um, financing. Um, it 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 it's incumbent upon developed countries to provide financing to develop con developing countries um, uh, to 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 um, combat ch climate change, whether it's mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage is not really included in the financing language under the Paris Agreement. But the Paris Agreement also says that countries in a position to do so may provide um, finance as well, or climate finance as well. So in my mind, these provisions under the Paris Agreement are where um, uh, non-developed countries um, fit into, into the picture. Um, and and should they feel in in a position to do so, then they would they are free to provide that that sort of financing. Um, I, I hesitate to go any further than that because these are discussion these are ongoing discussions, um, and and um, some of those issues um, may be um, coming out of the recommendations of the transitional committee at the end of the year. Completely valid, and thank you for the answer. The next question is also quite heavy, and it's why are most environmental laws not legally binding? Um, I would I would um, dispute that interpretation. Um, I think you, we have to look at international law versus um, laws at the national level, um, and most and. Every national system is quite different, but most national level uh, systems that have environmental laws um, have some form of bindingness to them. So that in the in the, at your national level, um, your international laws will potentially have um, some form of of regulatory um, system associated with it, and um, and some bindingness. Um, however, at the international level, 
Um, it's not just around environmental law, it's around um, enforcement of international law um, itself, because countries are sovereign and, and have and can make choices around um, what they do. Um, uh, and and uh, governments can't be um, they can agree to be bound, but they can, but there's very little enforcement at the international level of any form of international law. Um, it's it's more problematic at the international level to enforce um, environmental law, and and we have um, more soft enforcement um, measures at the international level. Um, but that's just the nature of of uh, sovereign governments and their ability to to do what what they like because they are sovereign. Yeah, makes sense. It would kind of go. Huh. And the next question is, where can one access information and discuss discussions by the transitional committee, or better yet, be part of this dialogue? Um, that's a good question, and and I would encourage people to to um, to seek out information and attempt to be part of these dialogues. Um, the, there, the UNFCCC website, which is unfccc.int, um, has all of the information um, around the work of the Transitional Committee. It, you know, it takes time sometimes for summary reports, et cetera, to come out, but, um, but each of the, the Transitional Committee uh, meetings, as well as the workshops, is, um, is webcast. And, um, and so that there's links to YouTube uh, recordings of these meetings um, and accompanying that are, are um, outcomes of the meetings and documents for the meetings. So for the second transitional committee, which is happening next week, there will be a recording of the, um, not of some of the, the side discussions, but certainly of the plenary meetings of the transitional committee. Um, and so you, will, you can watch those. Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to actually intervene or participate, but you can certainly watch them, and um, and you will have access to all the documents that um, are prepared for that transitional committee meeting. And then once there's a report of that meeting, you will um, be able to to access that report all on the um, UNFCCC website. Um, so I encourage you to stay involved. Thank you. The last question is, what are the mechanisms of funding for loss and damage? Do you think it's going to be based on grants and subsidies or loans? Um, well, that's a good question. And, and those are the things that are, are um, that the transitional committee is grappling with. One of their um, one of their mandates is to look at the current landscape around uh, funding for loss and damage. Um, and so so that that analysis is, is being done. Um, so for example, um, humanitarian aid, um, how much could, how could that be considered um, an existing piece of the landscape for funding uh, loss and damage and, and determining where the gaps are and, and, um, and what we don't know and, and what isn't being funded at this point in time. And so that's what that's a, a huge part of what the transitional committee is is working out and has a mandate to work out at this stage. In terms of whether it will be um, subsidies, grants, or loans. Again, that's also an issue that needs to be um, to be uh, further considered. Um, most developing countries are are calling for um, all loss and damage funding to be grant based. Um, however, um, we have to think about the reality associated with um, with how much money there is and um, and who's providing the, the funding, et cetera, and also look at um, uh, vulnerability and, and issues of that sort. And those are, those are all part of the larger question around um, international finance reform that I, that I had in my last slide and looking at different ways to measure vulnerability and, and who, who's eligible for grants versus loans, et cetera. And those are all pieces of the conversation that are, are happening this year. Thank you so much. It's, it's a very complicated process. So thank you so much for helping <laughs> us go through it and navigate it, navigating it. Um, okay, so before I hand over to Jen for the last uh, thing, I would like to have some miscellaneous input. 
Uh, a lot of you are asking on the certificates, whether they're going to be physically distributed or virtually, they will be virtual. There will be no physical graduation, so to speak. Uh, the recordings will be sent out and the first session's recordings were already sent. For the English recordings, you'll find them on the YouTube uh, for the Smith School under live. The attendance form will be open until May 24th, so please don't worry about that. The slides will be shared and we will create a community space uh, for you guys. The translated versions of this session will be a little bit late, will only come out next week. And the sessions are every other week, 4 to 6 p.m. UK time every time. The booklet has been sent out a few times and we will send it again so everyone can see what's on the horizon. All right, and now I'm handing over to Jen. Thank you so much, Myrna. Yeah, and thank you once again um, for, for that amazing contribution. So a little word sort of our funders and contributors. Yeah, uh, thanks again to Net Oxford Net Zero and the Smith School of Enterprise and Environment from the Oxford University for funding our, our program. Also the, the Van Hundet Fund and our amazing partners who are doing the interpretation, the eco-interpreters, thank you so much for existing and for reducing this language barrier gap that is facing this earth. So, all right. So now for some showcasing of uh, interesting stuff that we found with Agustin, our chairman, last week. Uh, there's this amazing game that is called Cascadia. Uh, this game um, prepares uh, people for uh, extreme weather events. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's an earthquake or uh, a cyclone. But uh, it, it gives you uh, some of the insights of the skills that are needed um, in order to survive emergencies. Uh, so I, I'll ask our technical team to give the link of this uh, in our YouTube and Zoom, uh, but you should check it out or just Google Cascadia in, uh, and you can find the game. It's pretty fun. We had so much fun last week with Agustin. All right, so talking about our next session, uh, we, we're going to have uh, the session on adaptation, but also resilience at the 31st of May. Uh, that, that is in two weeks. Uh, we're going to have Prof Professor Chukumerije, uh, Ma Maria del Pilar Bueno, Francis Manson, and Juan Carlos Varela uh, from the Climate Champions team. and. We are so happy uh, of these speakers and we're looking forward to see you guys again in two weeks. But uh, things are not over yet because uh, we are happy to announce that we started the process and accepted the first round of volunteers for the making of the Global Youth Action Book of this year. So uh, we are going to share um, another link for an optional bonus activity. So this is gonna be our homework for this week. And let's be creative and mobilize everything that we thought, what we felt uh, in this session, uh, tell our neighbors or make a video, write a poem, uh, write a, a post, uh, upload a story or anything that you want. And you can use the hashtags, GYC and Global Youth Training and um, you can upload your action to um, the, the forms that is in the QR. So I recommend you take a picture right now, a screenshot or anything in order to access the QR code. We will also be sending this with in the email and join the action so we can showcase what the whole youth is doing around the world. So more information coming uh, about the the Global Youth Climate Training Book and the next emails. Thank you so much. All right, Marina, some last words from your side. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We hope you had 
a good time in the session. Uh, we were happy to facilitate it for you guys. And thank you to all the amazing speakers, performers, and everyone who worked super hard to make this happen. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks time. We hope you enjoyed the activity. Uh, take a look at all the things we uh, shared. And we are so sorry. Uh, we had a speaker lined up uh, Willie, but he was not able to join us this time. Uh, we hope you still had a good time. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, D don't forget to uh, go to our social media. Uh, we will be posting um, a link so you can get a frame and post uh, that you were at this session. Uh, and we will be sharing those as well. So don't remember, don't forget to <laughs> follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn. And thank you so much for being here and existing. Let's go tribe, let's go save the world. All right, bye everyone. Bye. And that's the music. <laughs>